Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. It is Super Tuesday. You went out, you voted. Here are the election results. Yeah, the race for a United States president, former President Donald Trump, easily winning the state's primary over Republican Nikki Haley. So you're looking at the numbers there um, at the state level. 78% support Donald Trump getting to Nikki Haley's 17% support. Also on the Republican side, but in Bear County, we can see how the former president did 73% of the vote in Bear County to 23% for Nikki Haley. Similar to how he did, uh, how they're doing in the state. Now, when it comes to the U.S. Senate race, Republican Ted Cruz just clinched his party's nomination. Yeah, the question is which Democrat is going to face him. Our Myra Arthur in studio with us now with the results of that race that frankly a lot of people thought might be closer, Myra. Yeah, this was actually a nine person race, but for all intents and purposes, it came down to two even then. It was never really close, even as early vote numbers were the only things we had to look at tonight. State Senator Roland Gutierrez up against Colin Allred, a U.S. rep from North Texas. Gutierrez, who represents the Uvalde area, has been a huge proponent of gun control in the wake of the Robb Elementary School shooting. Allred, not a name as well known here in South Texas, but a name that raked in the campaign dollars to pepper the area with ads for what he stands for. One of those issues being a woman's right to choose. Let's take a look at the statewide results here first. Colin Allred with 60% of the vote. Roland Gutierrez with 17%. You can see Mark Gonzalez there uh, squeaking in 9%. Here in Bear County, let's see how that compares to our local numbers. Colin Allred, 49% of the vote. Roland Gutierrez getting 32%. Again, that local name recognition probably having something to do with that as well. Now, despite a large deficit all night long, Gutierrez was pretty positive throughout the night at his watch party. But just about 20 minutes ago, he gave his concession speech standing in front of families of Robb Elementary victims. It was a passionate one. Take a listen. But I promise you here right now that my fight against Ted Cruz isn't over. And my fight against Donald Trump isn't over. And my fight against these Republicans isn't over. Because, folks, they don't give one damn red cent about you. And I can't tell you how much it means to me to be your nominee, to be the next senator from the great state of Texas. And while I will be the Democratic nominee, I want every Texan to know, whether you're a Democrat, an Independent, or Republican, that I want you to be involved in this campaign. And I want to serve you in the United States Senate. That, of course, Colin Allred, who has claimed victory tonight and will be facing Ted Cruz in November for the race for U.S. Senate. I noticed some of the family members standing behind Roland Gutierrez with tears running down their eyes. That yeah. was certainly emotion filled. You have to think about all the emotion that has been in that community. That's been a huge reason they have supported him throughout his campaign. And of course, they're upset to see it in this way tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Myra. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's go to a Republican race. This is U.S. District 23. So that seat currently belongs to Tony Gonzalez. We know that four people challenged him for the nomination, but right now it looks like this is going to go to a runoff. 46% uh, support with Tony Gonzalez. Ardanile Barra has been covering this race today. He still didn't manage to get that 50% plus one threshold. She joins us now. She's live from the congressman's office. Daniela. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, we were hoping to speak with Tony Gonzalez this evening. His campaign told us that he would be made available, but I reached out nine times over the course of the past two hours, have not heard back. One of the things we wanted to ask him is what he thought about his race likely heading into a runoff. Gonzalez, he has been the congressman for this district since 2020. Last year, he was censured by his own party for votes that split with the Republican Party. That includes supporting a bill defending same-sex marriage protections and a bipartisan gun bill. Now, to give you an idea of just how large this district is, it stretches from El Paso all the way here to San Antonio's west side. Covers a large stretch of the border, too. Now, the candidate Gonzalez will likely face in the runoff is Brandon Herrera. He's a social media personality and a Second Amendment activist. Now, over in the Democratic primary, there are two challengers. As At last check, the vote is split in half between Lee Bassinger and Santos Limon. On the northwest side, Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News.
for all those races that go off to a runoff, that race is going to take place May 28th. That's when the runoff election is going to be. All right, the GOP race for state representative in District 121, that has also been discussed heavily. It looks like a newcomer has taken down an incumbent tonight. Yeah, it's a race that's been making a lot of headlines along with everything that's happened at our southern border in recent weeks, but it also came down to the school voucher debate. Steve Allison was one of those incumbents targeted by Governor Greg Abbott, and it appears as if the governor was successful. Challenger Mark LaHood, who the governor endorsed with 55% of the vote to just 39% for Steve Allison. This is with 29% reporting. Our Dylan Collier has been covering this race for us. Representative Steve Allison was seeking a fourth term in office, but appears to have learned a hard lesson about what can happen if you get sideways with Texas Governor Greg Abbott. After Allison opposed Abbott's school voucher proposal, the governor threw his support behind challenger Mark LaHood. Allison's record in office became the focal point of numerous attack ads, and it appears the tide turned against him. Allison said Abbott's intrusion in the race was inexcusable. Uh, I'm disappointed in the governor. The governor's contributed to this quite heavily. Uh, that makes no sense. LaHood, meanwhile, says his message began to really resonate with voters late in this election. Slowly, more and more momentum, more and more people were reaching out to him. And the last probably two and a half, three months, we've really seen it skyrocket. The winner of the Republican primary moves on to face Democrat Laurel Jordan Swift in the November election, although this seat has been a Republican mainstay for quite some time. Reporting on the far north side, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. OK, now we're going to take a look at the race for a Republican state representative in District 44. We know that John Kimple currently uh, has that seat. He faced three other challengers, but it looks like right there, Alan Schoolcraft just slightly ahead of him. 99 percent of precincts or polling stations are reporting right now. 47 support, uh, 47 percent of the voters went for Alan Schoolcraft over John Kimball's 46 percent. So it looks like here we're also heading to another runoff race because neither of them managed to get just just over 50% support. And that's another race where the governor endorsed Alan Schoolcraft, who is winning, but it looks like it will go to a runoff with the incumbent, John Kempel. All right, let's go to the Democratic race now for Bear County Commissioner Precinct 1. So this seat belongs to incumbent Rebecca Clay Flores. Uh, and if you look at the numbers right there, she has 48% support, but if you also look at the top right hand corner, she only only 17 percent of the polling stations are reporting. So there's a chance that she could get over 50 percent. We'll see. Our Patty Santos has been on top of the race and now joins us live. Yeah, with so many people running in this race, there's always been a feeling that this could potentially go to a runoff. Now, uh, Rebecca Clay Flores has camp here, not ready to call it a runoff yet. They're waiting for one more update from the elections office before they do that. But early voting numbers had Flores in a slight lead, but never really over the 50 percent mark. With a significant lead, she's hopeful that voters are paying attention to what she's been doing for Precinct 1. And she says campaigning has been e easier with financial support this time around. Now, her opponent, expected opponent, Amanda Gonzalez, says she's excited to head to a runoff. She's rallying up support from those other candidates who ran against Flores. Gonzalez says the support has the support of the Bear County Sheriff's Deputies Association. For Gonzalez, the focus for her campaign is on public safety. Now, Clay Flores is focused on expanding mental health services for her community. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is making sure um, that public safety is at the forefront. I believe that all residents should feel safe inside and outside of their homes. Um, and I think in this race, most importantly, we have seen that public safety is not a priority. We serve the rural communities as well. So that's something that's really lacking more mental health, forensic beds, not just for adults, but for our teenagers as well. And again, we're still waiting for those final numbers to come in tonight. But if there is a runoff, it's going to take place at the end of May. Whoever wins that race will head to the November election against Republican, uh, who was unopposed, Lita Prado. We're going to stay here tonight and bring you the very latest on KSAT.com. We'll send it back to you. Patty, thank you. Now the race for GOP Bear County Commissioner Precinct 3. That has been a tight one. Yeah, Republican Grant Moody won this seat in a special election in 2022. Let's go to the latest numbers tonight. Moody has been leading all night, but again, 
It's kind of frustrating that we had low turnout right. today, but only 17% of the vote has been counted so far. I'm kind of wondering what's going on at the Bear County Election Commissioner's Office. But Grant Moody, 52%. Chris Shukart with 48%. Our Garrett Berger is joining us live with more. And I think because of those low numbers, Garrett, Grant Moody's not declaring victory tonight. That's correct, Steve. Now, 16 months ago, he won this seat in a special election, but because of timing issues, he got to skip the primary. Now tonight, with a full term on the line, he does appear on the cusp of winning his first primary. Now, he has not declared victory yet, very carefully not, not declaring that, but he did address his supporters a few minutes ago, telling them that his campaign is encouraged by the results so far. Moody's a former active duty Marine fighter pilot and has held leadership roles at USAA and Valero Energy. He's currently the lone Republican on the five member Bear County Commissioner's Court. Though he pointed to a new property tax exemption and more law enforcement officers in the county budget as things he was still able to accomplish. Now, having had 15 months in office now, I asked him what he thinks he could do with 48 months, a full four year term. His answer a lot more. You know, we focused on public safety, which I still think is, is foundational and pri priority number one. Uh, but also there's work to be done around spending, around making sure we get, um, you know, our, our property taxes down. You know, the state's made some progress. We were able to secure a $70 million property tax cut for the hospital district. But there's more work that needs to be done on that front. Moody's opponent, business owner Chris Shuhart, has tried to position himself to the right of Moody, accusing the incumbent of voting with the court's Democrats most of the time instead of making an ideological stand. Now, Moody has said most county business isn't partisan. And this is an argument that appears to have helped keep Shuhart close to Moody, but we still haven't seen him actually close that gap in the polls today. Now, we asked Shuhart just a few minutes ago how he was feeling about the status of the race. He texted this back to me saying, quote, we're hanging in for going against a governor, senator, congressman, three public sector unions and over a dozen PACs. And this is being a reference to some of the support that incumbent Grant Moody has received. We'll see who ends up going against Democrat Susan Corbell. She is the obvious Democrat candidate being the only one to run on that side of the aisle. Live at the Moody Watch Party, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Our election coverage continues after the break. We're going to hear from Lee Waldman, who's been staying on top of the races in Uvalde. And as we head to the break, here are the results from the other races that we are following tonight. Welcome back in Uvalde. We have been following a handful of races. Some of them include law enforcement officers who were named in the Justice Department's report that looked at how first responders reacted during the Rob Elementary School shooting in May of 2022. Yeah, Lee Waldman in Uvalde as those election numbers were unveiled outside Uvalde's newspaper. The big races that we were following, Uvalde County Sheriff and Constables for Precincts 1 and 6. The incumbents for those races, Ruben Olasco, Johnny Field and Emmanuel Zamora, all three named in the Department of Justice report because they all responded to Robb Elementary the day that 21 people were killed inside of that elementary school. The sheriff's race going into a runoff between Olasco and challenger Otto Arnon. Zamora will be keeping his Constable Precinct 6 seat overwhelmingly, but the surprise of Super Tuesday is the Constable Precinct 1 spot. Field will be unseated by challenger Max Dorflinger, who also responded to the Rob shooting, but for the Uvalde Police Department. The former mayor of Uvalde, Don McLaughlin, who is running for state representative District 80, getting huge support here in Uvalde County. He'll easily be going to the November election against a Democratic challenger. We spoke to McLaughlin about what this means to him. What you see is what you get with me. I'm not afraid to speak out and call it like I see it. I'm going to fight hard for this district, whether whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to fight for the people of the district of uh, District 80 and, you know, try to get things done in our district.
We asked McLaughlin if he would still support raising the age to purchase a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. Like he said when he was mayor here in Uvalde, he says he'll have to assess where things like mental health and violent video games are before he makes a decision on that vote. We know there is still some disappointment from the survivors, families and victims, families of that Robb Elementary shooting because of how the sheriff's race is going and because of one of those constable races. But we know that the their calls for accountability will not end here. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. For a complete recap of the 2024 primary elections, head to KSAT.com. A lot more races than we could cover in the time that we have here, but we've got it all on KSAT.com. Just look for this article. Okay, now we're going to transition over to weather. 70 degrees out there right now, and it's going to get cooler, right? It is no more 90s. Earlier today, we actually made it to 91 for the high temperature. That's the warmest we've been, the hottest temperature so far this year. First 90 degree day and the warmest we've been since October 21st. But say goodbye to the 90s. Let's take a look at our temperature trend. Tomorrow, back in the 80s, 84 for the high temperature, and then we drop into the upper 70s by Thursday and Friday. So that's still above average, but then watch what happens thereafter. This weekend, we're back to the 60s for afternoon high temperatures. So a big tumble in our temperatures. And with that, too, even a shot at rain coming our way. Now, notice tomorrow morning, sunrise, about 7 a.m., we start the day in the upper 50s. That's upper 50s locally, a little bit cooler, low to mid 50s as you get into the hill country, even pushing 50 degrees, Kerrville and Comfort. Those will be the coolest locations, whereas Floresville, right at 60. By the noon hour, we're up to 76, 84 for the high. Not too humid, another beautiful day, just not as hot as what we had earlier today. Again, the 90s are gone around San Antonio for the foreseeable future. But tomorrow afternoon, Catula, Carrizo Springs, Del Rio, the typically warmer locations, still pushing 90 degrees tomorrow afternoon. But Leon Springs, 83, Elmendorf, 85, Stone Oak, 84 for the high temperature. Notice our big picture and the big pattern here. Severe weather off to our east today, southeastern U.S., parts of the Gulf Coast. Widespread rainfall, the kind of rain that we need. Our next hope for some rain is this little swirl in the Pacific that's west of San Francisco. That's headed our way. It's going to throw some upper-level energy our way and combined with some instability to trigger some storms across Texas. Now that's going to be th late Thursday on into early Friday morning. It's not a slam dunk for us, but we'll be on kind of the tail end of the activity. But whatever does happen to develop really has the chance of becoming strong to severe, especially along and west of I-35. And even into the hill country, some scattered severe weather, a little bit more likely than what we'll have locally. About 40% coverage for that primary risks would be localized hail and localized wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. That's our only shot at some rain and not everybody's going to get it. And I think the actual potential for accumulations on the low end. But look at the weekend mornings in the 40s, afternoons well into the 60s. Hey, the countdown's on. 34 days until the total solar eclipse. All right, thank you. We're going to check in on the Spurs, give you highlights after the break. Wimby got the green light tonight to face the Houston Rockets, and he made an immediate impact by scoring the game's first five points. First quarter, Wimbanyana blocks Alperin Shingun's shot. He grabs the defensive rebound, then he takes the ball back the other way, then drains a three-pointer over Shingun, and it's 5 nothing Spurs. They led 26-21 after one. Early second quarter, Blake Wesley will dime a wide-open Wimby because his defender fell down for a slam dunk. Spurs led 53-47 at halftime. Wimby had 10 points and three blocks. Third quarter now play gets a little chippy. Amen Thompson and Jeremy Sohan collide while going for a rebound. Jeremy is down. Thompson gets tripped and falls as Jeremy runs back. The two collide. Of course, they go face to face and that's really about it. Double technicals were called and Jeremy was hit with a flagrant foul. One Spurs trailed 80 to 77 after three. Fourth quarter while well, the Rockets pull away behind Shen who scores two of his career high 45 right over Wimby. Victor was held scoreless in the second half and the Rockets beat the Spurs 114 to 101 and Pop wasn't happy. 
it put us in mud. We didn't respond to it very well, and you got the outcome. So, uh, you know, young group needs to understand the road is a lot different than at home, and uh, it requires a little bit more mental toughness, and we didn't have that tonight. Spurs will head west to play the Kings Thursday night at 9. The Veterans Memorial Boys basketball team is one of two local squads who made it to the state tournament. The Patriots have a record of 40 and 1 and hope to make it 42 wins and get their first state title this weekend. This group of Pats has payback in mind after losing in the state semis last season to the eventual 5A state champs Dallas Kimball. And the players told us last year's loss is what's motivating them to win it all this year. We all made it our goal that we're going to get back and we're going to win it. Because, you know, we was so close to getting it, there, uh, getting it last year and winning it all. To advance the seniors from last year, we want to help get the job done and just bring one to the uh, San Antonio Veterans Memorial. We just didn't want how we felt last year to come through this year. So as we go into this game, we know we, we know we got some stuff to change, and uh, we plan to do that. We feel like we're the best team in the state because uh, we practice hard, because we play hard, because we trust each other. I think Coach said it best. Um, it was kind of like a blur. But now at this stage, we know what we have to do. We were in the same position last year. We know what it takes, so we just got to come out execute. The Patriots will face Colleen Ellison in the 5A state semis at 7 p.m. on Thursday at the Alamo Dome. Former Bernie Greyhound star athlete Quentin Dormady is one of three quarterbacks fighting to lead the San Antonio Brahmas this season. Last season, he played for the XFL Orlando Guardians, who did not make the cut when the XFL and the USFL formed the United Football League. We sent Mary Rominger to Brahmas training camp at South Lake Carroll High School, where she went one-on-one -on -one with Dormandy. Quentin, one week of training camp in the books. How are you feeling up to this point? Feeling good. Um, you know, happy to be back out here um, getting reps and working with the guys. Um, I think the progression's been good. Um, just, you know, continue to work day by day and, and uh, try to progress. Can you bring me back to the moment you were selected number one overall in the UFL second dispersal draft? What emotions went through your body at that time? Yeah, I mean, it was exciting, obviously, um, you know, to get another chance after, um, you know, my team last year, Orlando, didn't make the merger and stuff. Um, there was, you know, a period of time there where it was, um, there was some uncertainty. So um, to be able to get this chance with, with this group and this coaching staff um, is definitely special. And, um, you know, I take that, I don't take that lightly. So thank, thank you very you. much for your time, Quentin. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Quentin. We'll have more of Dormady and the Brahmas tomorrow. And that is a wrap for sports. As we said, it's Super Tuesday. Our John Paul Barajas has been at election headquarters all day and most of the night long. That's right. He's been staying on top of voter turnout. And the story tonight in Bear County, is it a low or slow voter turnout? Behind me, election officials are counting up the votes. And as of 930, election officials tell us 78,238 people have come to the polls today, bringing the total number of registered voters in Bear County who voted just under 15 percent. Here at election headquarters, we saw a small crowd this afternoon, but the line never exceeded 10 to 15 people. County Elections Administrator Jackie Callan says after seeing issues with mail-in ballots a few weeks ago, today ran smoothly. She adds today they've seen at least 10 sites that only saw about 50 voters, while well, they had five sites that saw over 1,000 people. And back out here, the voting counting continues, and it's going to be a long night for the people behind the glass. Again, they told us they've seen over 78,000 people who came to polls just today. And to compare, on Super Tuesday in Bear County in 2020, they counted 113,650. Election officials say numbers online might be trying to catch up, and that's why some people might be seeing a difference at this moment in time. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. There are a lot of races tonight. Just a reminder for a complete recap of the 2024 primary elections, just head to KSAT.com. Look for this article that you see there on your screen, and we'll be right back after this. All right, here's an eclipse fact. We're 34 days away, 108 miles. That's the average width of the path of totality, which is impressive. Hey, 60s by the weekend for highs. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.